for this project began several years ago with Erica Svensson and Lindsay Campbell, research social scientists at the USDA Forest Service's New York City Urban Field Station. They had worked with me on developing our ecology curriculum into a team taught exploration of urban systems interacted with, interactive with human communities, non-human biota, and all of the intertwined phenomena and processes that we general, generalize as environment. Together with Andrea Parker, one of the course instructors and executive director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, we started having conversations about the combination of geography, anthropology, human ecology, biology, history, and community engagement under our umbrella term of ecology. Our goal is to offer grounding to our students whose future work must span politics and ecology, social and biological, so they can generate transdisciplinary conversations across multiple scientific disciplines, design practices, and a diverse public. No Ecology textbook offers a rubric for this, so we've chosen to open a conversation about what we designers, planners, researchers, and humans need to know and how to teach. In our first two conversations, speakers from a range of disciplines reflected on a zombie idea that they have contested through design planning or projective research and analysis. We've considered killing the thinking that truncates timeframes and monetizes agency and professional design and planning practice, rebutted assertions that environmental initiatives are always good for communities, and exploded the scale of what we think of as the human ecosystem from the macro, like the electrical grid, to the micro, the bacteria inhabiting us and spreading through our septic systems and into our waterways. And we started to root out underlying concepts that beg critique in terms of how our cultural values, social policies, and biotic systems are intertwined. Tonight's speakers will present their own zombie ideas, and we look forward to branching this discussion out into new directions and adding layers of nuance to ideas already in the air. I want to welcome and thank the speakers participating in tonight's conversation. You can find all of their bios online, so we will not fill time here recounting them, but I want to offer a special thanks to Tim Malley for moderating this discussion. He is a repeat offender speaking in MLA events because of his exceptional wit and incisive lines of thought. And finally, welcome to everyone logged on. Please be aware that we're recording this and we've put a link for the recording of last week's conversation in the chat for anyone who missed it. Thank you, Tim, and over to you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'm not gonna say a lot. I'm really excited about these four talks. You'll quickly see why, I think. Um, but I do wanna plant an idea in everyone's head just as as you and uh, suggest that you, as you're listening to these talks, think about how each of these speakers is thinking about events, beginnings and endings. We'll leave it at that, uh, and um, I think that may inform some of the conversation and some of the ways we might connect things together. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite Maria Villa Lobos to begin. Hey everybody, just a second while I figure out the screen sharing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure she has failed, please try again later. Okay, <laughs> let me try again. Oh, sorry about that. All right, looks like it's working, right? Yeah. So good evening and thank you for this opportunity. So today I would like to invite you to a journey <laughs> uh, a little bit away from here, <laughs> since we, we can use a break, uh, to the tropical dry forest, which is one of the most endangered tropical ecosystems due to the extraction of a variety of plants and animals and products the control of land uses by external economies, lack of study, and the access of long-term ecological monitoring and researching. Why do I care so much? Because I grew up there. I grew up in the tropical dry forest and one of my dearest memories are from this garden I have talked to some of you, many of you about before, um, the tropical, the botanic garden of Maracaibo created by um, 
Leandro Aristigueta and Roberto Burle Marx. However, tonight I don't want to describe the garden. I don't want to focus on the what. Um, I've been reflecting a lot about the how and how along the way um, was it autocracy, the underlying notion that we were figuring out how to overcome? Because abandonment, closure, disappearance, attacks to our culture and to our nature uh, were not unique to our botanic garden. They were not unique to Venezuela's modern tropical landscapes. They were not unique to Brazilians' tropical, modern tropical le landscape legacy. Um, not even the UNESCO seems to <laughs> really know how to <laughs> keep their own gardens um, designed by Burle Marx in good shape. So in this process, and I'll spend the first three minutes about this just to, because I thought it's important to, to be honest about where your questions and ideas come from. And when we were faced to, with the challenge of reopening a garden, the a cultural landscape that has been closed for 20 years, you know, the difficult part wasn't how, the what, right? The, the, the difficult part was how. Um, how could we face a garden that was closed by a dictatorship? How could we overcome armies standing with guns on, at the doors of the garden? And, and what we tried to do was not to think about a project. We had no interest on a project, but rather on a framework, on a process, a system that addresses not only the scale on the garden to the right, but rather the scale of the region to the left. And how if the garden with its urban essence is a synthesis of the larger territory and the city scale, then how could, how could the lessons inside the garden speak about ways to overcome that autocracy that is asphyxiating uh, everything that we hold dear? I told you about the emotions we felt before when the water came back and the birds came back and the photographers and the birds and life basically came back. I have spoken before about how this was done, but I wanted to, for me tonight, it's more about the emotions we felt when we saw our nieces coming down the slides that we had reconstructed about the joy and the energy when the first drop of water came down and all our friends came to help because there was no budget, there was no money, there was no team, there was no client, there was no structure, but there were the people of the dry forest, right? The, the human forest that Erica spoke so eloquently about. So skill. And then we understood that perhaps, perhaps it's possible to think that ancestrality is a notion that we can embrace to overcome autocracy by understand these kinds of understandings of a long turn of crossing time uh, and space in scale. Perhaps that helps us move away from uh, totalitarianism and from totalitarian approaches. No? And you do that by staying on message, <laughs> like the best of politicians, uh, drawing systems, uh, drawing an idea rather than a project, drawing something that can be replicable that people could embrace uh, so that we are not here to deliver a solution, but actually to pass on to certain um, questions that everybody can they take back. And, and that sending that message, that is staying on message. That's how you cross the skills, right? That's how you disseminate the ancestral ideas. And that's a didactic process, right? Um, with the hope that really is those didactic collective practices, the ones that have a chance in the long run to prove how irrelevant unidirectional processes are. Therefore, we don't trust numerical indicators of success. We can't allow anybody to measure us by the numbers. Um, we draw what we need, really, and that we learn in the garden. We could only draw what's necessary for the project. Basically, we have no money to afford any other kinds of drawings. And, and we believe that you learn by doing. But ultimately, that is not only about the scale of the garden, that is about taking it out for a walk, that the most important missions are invisible to the eyes. 
And autocracy really is not a good friend of the invisible, right? They panic when they can see things. So we think, oh, that's power. So life, life is perhaps another way to fight autocracy um, because in the face of life, dystopia is not possible, right? So when you span the, the, the scale and you start talking about researching productive technological engagements, trusting your emotions as sources of knowledge, right? That if you are angry, there is knowledge there. That if you are, if you are outraged, there is knowledge there. That, the, that our emotions are telling us something. And most importantly, uh, life is about nonlinear progressions. And that, and that that is resilience, right? So non-linear like this presentation, which is gonna jump back and forth. So uh, for us, it's really not about the name of the phase in which you are in the project, but rather about the flexibility of moving you know, from phase one to phase four, to phase seven, to phase eight, whatever, if you wanna give it numbers. Um, last year, two years ago at CUNY, a professor said that in Latin America, we first buy the windows before we design the house. <laughs> that flexibility, you know, uh, autocracy needs you to follow the rules, needs you to follow the process, needs you to be linear so that you can keep control. But that large scale makes us very curious and we quickly wanted to go see, you know, if some of these questions, some of these ideas actually make sense in the, is it about the dry forest? that administers every drop of water and endures long periods of drought to then explode in a magnificent golden spring, as Romulo Gallegos will say. We wanted to see, well, is it about the dry forest? Is it the people of the dry forest? Like, what, what is it? Is it the living beings of the dry forest? So we wanted to go out there to the tropical dry forest of the Caribbean Sea and take notes and learn while traveling, learn by traveling. So today I want to take you to the tropical dry forest in the United States in Puerto Rico, Guanica. Guanica uh, was protected in 1981 by the United Nations, but you know, all they do is the declaration and then that's about it. <laughs> um, 4,000 hectares big, uh, it located in the, <clears throat> in the Caribbean coast of Puerto Rico, right here, the entire area that you see color in yellow is tropical dry forest. Uh, and it expands to Mona, Viques, Monito, Culebra. Um, and xerophytic plants are the predominant vegetation. Important to say that in Puerto Rico, you find more tree species than in the entire continental United States, including Alaska. Mm. So, it's uh, really a, a, a memory. I know I, I, I'm probably close to the 10 minutes. I'm going to wrap up. I wanted to go there because I wanted to see the Guamachos, the Guayacan Centenario. However, in that process, I also knew I wanted to see the traces of the sugar miles, the azucareras, the past of the slavery, and the kind of abandonment, the, the landscapes of abandonments that were there. And what were the relationships with the tropical dry forest and abandonment? However, I found familiar images no, of these kinds of things that I seen before I grew up in them. And I met Miguel, the garden of the forest, the forest itself, perhaps. And he, throughout his life, from his youth to nowadays, continues to be the one that is the voice out there protecting that. Then you go along the path, you come back from the trip, you try to make the growings, you don't finish because you don't have enough resources, you don't have enough team, but that's our process. It's always ongoing, it's not, it has nothing to do with perfection, it's unfinished and it's alive. The process is alive. Sometimes it's not about the resources and the time, but I really have to learn scuba diving to draw the coral for you guys. So. You put together the palaces, you go through the files, that's the process is very flexible, no? when you have to administer these resources. And I'm coming down to the last two slides to say that you know those people of the forest, that human forest, they don't give up. They know how to fight autocracy. It's in the long run. It's not in the one day. It's not with a project. It's not a project. The notion of a project, I debate and I contest and I, prefer to think of these constellations in these coalitions in these long lasting living learning schools that are ancestral, that are didactic, that are alive, and therefore fight every day 
that autocracy, that whatever happens this week is ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll now ask Cassie Fennell to pick up the conversation. Hopefully see my image. Can people see yeah. it? Yes. Big tree, yes, is that right? Yeah, okay, great. So I wanna thank Denise for inviting me and Tim, of course, for finding time. Uh, I don't know how anyone's finding time at this time, but you found, you've extracted some time to respond and I really appreciate that. So the idea that I'd like to lay rest tonight has to do with the demolition of housing a issue that stands at the center of my research for quite a long time in the late industrial Midwest. Most of my work is in Chicago on public housing reform and then on the management of what are called highly vacant spaces like, like this one here. Um, but I've also done some work in Detroit on their um, ambitious house demolition program. Okay, so we often think about housing demolition as a discrete event with a discernible beginning and an end. What I wanna emphasize tonight though is that the home doesn't end when its residents move on, when a wrecking ball, sorry, can you not see this? Yes, can you see that? When a wrecking ball stops swinging or when all the related debris and dust that this process kicks up finally settles. Rather, the endings of homes are ongoing and accretive processes, regardless of whether the home is felled by mechanical equipment like here, by arson like here, by neglect, by weathering, by economic abandonment, often where I work some combination of all these things, how it unfurls will affect those who live within its reach and also those who work within its reach. This includes former residents and their neighbors, of course, but it also includes anyone who manages the psychic and material remainders of, the, of these homes. So think here inspectors, social service workers, salvagers, gardeners, waste managers, contractors, right? All these people are interesting to me. I think if we bury the idea that demolition is, is a discrete event, we can then attend to how residential buildings unfurl across space and time and what discernible effect such unfurling has upon urbanite sensibilities, their bodies, and also very interesting to me, their imaginations, especially as a political anthropologist, their political imaginations. So I've written extensively about um, how uh, destroyed homes linger in, in the minds and the bodies of people who used to live in them in my first book. And what I'd like to focus on here is how unfurling homes shape the bodies and the imaginations of people who have never lived in them, right? But who are nevertheless dwelling in their long and expansive footprints. So before I turn to a couple examples, I just wanna say a bit more about how I'm framing this unfurling home or this unfolding home. You know, I'm not quite sure what I wanna settle on here. Okay, so I'm gonna admit that I do not consider the insight that a residential building unfurls in consequential political ways to be that novel, right? In proposing it, I am indebted to scholars like Rob Nixon and Ann Stoller. And so for those of you who are not familiar with their work, basically um, Nixon's interests mm -hmm. uh, are in environmental activism, especially um, uh, you know, as mobilized by impoverished people. And that's pushed him to think about something he calls, quote, slow violence, right? And he says this is a kind of violence that, quote, occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed uh, destruction that is dispersed across time and space, and an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. Right? And Stoller's work with uh, post-colonialism makes a similar point when she develops this idea of ruination, which she sees as an active and ongoing process that distributes the debris of colonial orders in the present in highly uneven and often highly inequitable uh, fashions. So I found Nixon and Stoller's thinking to be especially helpful for grasping the corrosive, even toxic, especially toxic dimensions of unfurling buildings in the places where I work, as well as the tendency for those corrosions to disproportionately harm lower income people of color, right? Um, where I depart from them, though, is my interest in the very wide range of values that adhere to unfurling homes. In other words, as much as these unfurling homes that interest me incite all manner of negative effects and corrosive um, uh, effects and also anxiety, right, I've also been surprised um, that the meanings and practices that are associated with them also exceed this negativity, and I want to talk about that you know, tonight. Okay, so I just have two examples. The first about what I'm thinking of as domesticated or the domestication of toxins, right? And the second about, uh, you know, um, growth horizons in, in our imagination of urban futures. Okay, so the first one, um, domesticated toxins. 
Okay, here we go. Okay, so throughout my research on public housing reform in Chicago, I happened to meet quite a lot of people who attributed the higher incidences of, of childhood lead poisoning in their community to what they called Project Gray, right? This is a term, Project Gray. Oh, it's Project, Project Gray's fault, right? Is what they would often say. So Project Gray is a shade of gray paint that was once prevalent throughout the hallways and stairwells of the uh, Chicago Housing Authority's housing projects, right? Uh, the link between paint, lead exposure, and aging or poorly maintain, maintained housing shouldn't surprise any of you. It's been a problem, a serious problem in urban America for a century, so it's nothing new. Um, but for my interlocutors, Project Gray was a particularly insidious example of this because according to them, it was especially leaded, right? This paint, they would tell me, was not originally intended for, for homes. Rather, they claimed that it was surplus battleship paint donated to the Housing Authority after World War II. So a totally different set of interlocutors will tell me a similar version of this story when they explain the prevalence of lead in uh, vacant residential properties that they own, manage, or simply squat upon, right? Either they live or garden on, you know, with, with permission or with not. Didn't I know one offered by way of explaining why local garden plots often take this shape? Can you see this on your screen, right? This is a very typical shape for garden plots where I work on the west side of Chicago, um, taking the shape of the actual building that used to be there, the actual residential building that used to be there. So why should it be such? And he said, well, didn't I know that you would never want to have a garden plot where the porch once stood, okay? Okay, so backwood, backwood porches used to stand um, at the back of these buildings, right? And they are often covered in what my interlocutors would tell me was battleship paint, right? Didn't I know they were also covered in battleship paint? And over time, that paint would flake off into the garden and, and, and be in the ground below the porch. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Chicago, most every older residential building has these expansive wooden porches that have to be covered uh, or treated in some ways to, to, to um, retain their structure, okay? So what interested me about these stories of battleship paint showing up in unexpected places is not so much whether or not they're true. I actually don't know if they're true and it doesn't really matter to me, right? But rather the ways in which they domesticate industrial toxins and the ways they render toxic exposure an unavoidable, but also utterly unremarkable fact of everyday life in an ecology that defies any clean lines we wanna draw between industrial orders and a domestic order, right? Um, now, I have many interlocutors who sought to eliminate or contain the threat that these, ex these toxins would pose, presumably to their health, by developing, instituting, and adhering to all sorts of uh, demolition or renovation or gardening protocols. Here's an example of people who are doing their dutiful raised beds, and you see a lot of this um, in the industrial Midwest, right? Um, trying to create a bar barrier between themselves and these substances, which they know are there. But I also have just as many who don't uh, do this at all, right? And uh, claim that is actually futile, right? Um, they're not at all ignorant, I need to stress, about the presence of lead in their lives, or for that matter, a whole bunch of related toxins like barium or chromium, right? They are keenly aware that the very ground of their residential life is comprised of a host, of uh, domestic and industrial byproducts like slag, obsolete building materials and infrastructure, and yesteryear's consumer goods like bottles, jugs, uh, marbles, milk glasses, toys, right? All this stuff regularly comes up out of the ground, right? That they, that they work or live with, right? So this has to do with residential fill and its composition, which I'm very interested in and happy to talk about uh, later if people have questions about it. My interlocutors do not seek to eliminate these substances from their lives, and in fact, they insist it would be impossible to do so. Rather, they make self-conscious decisions about how to navigate their corrosive dimensions um, and trading advice about everything from where one is likely to encounter substances in their distribution, but also how they can safely uh, grow and consume, you know, food that they grow actually within this substance, right? So they're not avoiding this, and I find this very interesting. All right, so my second example is this question of like urban futures and growth horizons. Okay, so by recent estimates, there are about 32,000 vacant lots within the city of Chicago alone, right? People are uh, actively acquiring lots in highly vacant residential areas like this one. This is a typical kind of acquisition here. This was bought for a buck about four years ago by, by two guys, they split it. They each put in 50 cents, right? Um, most of the time people acquire these as investments or um, as a kind of speculation opportunity. Um, 
and they're expecting at some point that property values will shift. And um, sometimes people are also engaged in commercial endeavors like you know, light agriculture or growing animals or food, this kind of thing. For the most part, these are seen as temporary productive uses uh, until a wave of expected growth will arrive. So throughout the nearly two decades I've spent thinking about this area, there's always some kind of impending project on the horizon that locals expect to result in substantial revaluation, right? Be that gentrification that's finally going to come or a series of sustainable housing developments that keep on being proposed for the area or most recently plans for solar fields or legal marijuana cultivation. Even projections, I find this most interesting, that over the next two decades, right, climate migrants will be coming to Chicago in search of abundant lands and waters and urban density, right, and manageable weather, right? So there's always this hope that something or expectation that something is coming, right? Urban geographers and geographies are often caught up in a play of devaluation and evaluation. This is nothing new if you study urban geography, as well as, um, um, so it's not surprising to see the prevalence of these growth expectations as well as anxieties that they will result in the displacement of people who live here, right? But alongside both these expectations, I've been intrigued by a minority of long-term residents who depart from these horizons altogether, right? Who do, are not waiting for growth and who are not actually expecting it, but finding a way to imagine um, a kind of being in this place that is radically presentist and divorced from the expectation that something is coming soon to you know, tamp over these vacant spaces. So I just wanna give a brief example. This is not the only one, but of a garden that I was especially interested in. This is a garden. Um, for those of you who know Chicago, this is in a part of the city called Lawndale. Ava, I saw that you're on, on, the, on the call, so I, I, I'm gonna point that out for you. This is the handiwork of someone who was introduced to me as an urban homesteader. Uh, he acquired this classic, what you can't see out of view, but a classic two flat residential building and the adjacent lot, which you can see, in a highly vacant area of the west side um, about 35 years ago. And he expected that he'd fix it up and eventually sell it to a local um, as, as the housing market improved, right? So there's farming in this family, like a lot of people in the Midwest. And he became interested in what the, the very peculiar topography of this space, of this adjacent lot, could mean for gardening. And I think you can see here that there's a kind of dip in the landscape here. And he, the first thing he did was plant some fruit trees in that dip. There's also a garden on the corresponding one in the front of the lot with the expectation that- I'm sorry, Cassie, I have to cut you off. We're past the 10 minutes. Um, but maybe we can return to it during the discussion. She can finish her sentence. <laughs> Oh my God, she's muted. She's, she's, I've muted you, Cassie, and you can unmute if you want to finish the thought. I'll finish my sentence. Um, <laughs> basically, this is someone who a lot of people are, are, are planting with the expectation that they're working with a settling landscape here, it, directly in the, 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 the wells of the houses that used to exist here, right? And I'm happy to talk more about this. Thanks, sorry for being the time jerk. Totally okay. Heather McMillan. Great, thank you. I'm just get set up here. Heather, we see, okay. Are we good? Yeah, now it's good. Fantastic, okay. Thank you so much for including me in this super interesting series. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. I'd like to uh, begin today with offering a land acknowledgement even though all of us are spending so much time on these little screens right now, we're still people living on a planet, standing on land. And um, for those of us that are in the US, I think we're kind of scattered around, but we're all standing on ancestral land, indigenous ancestral land. Here, I am in um, Hawaii, which is the ancestral homelands of Kanaka O'ivi. And our host institution, had we all been gathered like we planned to about a year ago, uh, we would be in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape. 
So as a first generation settler colonist in illegally occupied Hawaii, I would like to honor these ancestral homelands um, of stewards of these lands, the people who have been guardians of these lands and caretakers of these lands and had inseparable kinship relationships with these lands from generations past, present, and continuing into the future. Um, the idea that I would like to uh, push up against today is this thought that indigeneity and urbanity are not actually opposite ends of a continuum. In fact, the US census data from 2010 tells us 71% of native people live in urban areas. And so uh, clearly urban places are also indigenous spaces. Uh, quickly, I want to just define local and indigenous knowledge. It's a concept I'll be referencing throughout. I believe many of you are familiar with it, but some important um, grounding is that this is not just data points, specific pieces of knowledge, but it's talking about an entire culturally grounded system where there are understandings and philosophies, worldviews that are developed over many generations as a continuum of people interact with their natural world. And this informs their daily life. People who are embedded in these kind of knowledge systems just refer to this as, as life. Something relevant for us thinking about urban spaces is that um, as a cultural um, system, this is something that's retained as it moves across space and time, but it's also modified, it's, it's plastic and it's um, adaptable. Here's an example some of you might be familiar with. Um, in New York City. This is um, the Hokulea, which is a traditional sailing vessel, non-motorized of the Polynesian Voyaging Society that uh, engaged in a round the world sail to promote aloha and um, indigenous and larger efforts for stewardship around the world. This is the um, Hokulea landing in New York City in 2016. Um, so I think this is a great illustration of the importance of indigenous and local knowledge being entering into this urban space. Um, coming from a background in anthropology, um, a lot of times indigenous and local knowledge is really focused on rural, remote, indigenous settings, but you know, there are a lot of opportunities to think about what does it mean um, to apply these place-based kinship-linked stewardship models in highly diverse, densely populated urban settings. You know, we can ask ourselves, what's the role or the potential for indigenous knowledge to be applied in cities in Hawaii or Lenape knowledge to be applied in cities in New York City? Um, I'll be talking about Hawaii and New York, but I want you to know that there, you know, this is something that is not limited to these spaces. There is a book coming out in which one of the chapters will focus on this Hawaii New York exchange. It's called Urban Nature, Enriching Belonging, Well-Being, and Bioculture. And there are examples from all around the world that really call into question the dominance of Western values of urban nature and the conservation of resource management and really drawing on indigenous and local knowledge to do that. Um, I just want to point out that, or acknowledge rather, that as um, someone whose ancestry is from Eastern Europe and from Scotland, I fully acknowledge and recognize kind of the awkwardness or strangeness of me um, presenting about indigenous and local knowledge in Hawaii. But for me to not do so is even more awkward. In my current position um, within a, a state agency, the Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife, and in my position as a community forester, I feel like I'm really holding space and making space for these ideas and conversations to become more institutionalized. So a critical um, concept that we work with um, and we have been refining this understanding is that of urban biocultural stewardship. And this is really grounded in indigenous um, stewardship models, uh, as well as being informed by civic environmental stewardship. The important thing here is that this is an entire system of caring. It's not just about 
um, specific plants or a specific place, but it's really the stewardship of the larger social ecological networks in the system. It understands cultural resources as equivalent to natural resources, and it's really all about the stewardship of the place as much as the stewardship of the people who dwell in that place. So a lot of my thinking about the relevance for indigenous and local knowledge for all areas beyond rural and remote areas has come from my engagement with Halau Ohia here in Hawaii. So Halau Ohia is a professional development stewardship training program for natural resource manager types. It's created by a master teacher and um, uh, musician and hula instructor and many more things. Her name is Kekuhi Keli'i Ohalilani Kanaka Ole. And um, she has been working with a cohort of us for about four years to help us better understand Hawaii life ways, rituals and stories as a way to be better at our jobs, to be better at taking care of our places, taking care of our communities and better knowing ourselves and our relationships in those places. So um, at, in conversations with my colleagues at the time I was with the Forest Service, um, we began to have a broader understanding of how applicable these were really kind of universal teachings that we were taking in and got really excited talking to Lindsay and Erica at the New York City Urban Field Station and wondered, hey, these could um, potentially be relevant for you as well in New York City. So we invited Kikuhi to lead a workshop um, in New York City and thankful, thankfully she agreed. Um, this really helped to address a gap in professional development and training that's currently available to natural resource managers. It usually focuses on the technical or the biophysical. This allowed um, people to explore um, spiritual dimensions of stewardship, um, different knowledge practice belief systems, different ways of knowing. Um, it was only two days, but sort of the results from that continue to ripple out and, and unfurl. Um, it's something that Lindsay and Eric also talked about uh, or referred to, I believe, in their presentations. One, I want to share a couple applications of um, indigenous knowledge in an urban context here in Hawaii. So one example is this concept of the kipuka. And in Hawaiian, this refers to a change in form. Uh, a lot of times people talk about kipukas. They're these forest islands that um, colonize um, on new lava flows. So here's an example of that. But we are working with that concept to expand it to thinking about urban biocultural kipuka. So it's not only you know, a green oasis surrounded by the built environment, um, focusing on the plants and the green, but it's also a space where people can engage with their knowledge systems and evolve those knowledge systems and pass them down and engage in reciprocal relationships with the land and also with each other. Another critical concept that um, illustrates indigenous and local knowledge applications and their, their potency for doing this kind of work, regardless of the space, is this idea of land as family. So kin-centric ecology is something that a lot of folks write about understanding the land as a family member. One of the first skills are that we're taught in Halau Uhia is to think about our genealogies and learn our genealogies not only going back to those um, bloodline relatives, but also the landscape features around you that are part of your family. So for example, I would explain to you the names of my, I won't do it here because of our time limits, but the names of my great, great grandparents from Scotland, Slovenia, and Poland, all the way down through my parents and to me. And then I would explain to you that um, I am here on this island of Oahu in the district of Kona in the Ahupua'a of Waikiki, sitting in the community of Pololo, and that my mountain is Leahi, and that my water source comes from Pololo stream, and that this is the place that gives me life. So really enforcing um, those connections in a really different way. People who are born here talk about um, being a keiki o ka'aina, which means a child of the land. Um, calling those things by those names really shifts the way that you think 
about your place and your relationship to it. I remember being on Hawaii Island talking to a woman who was born and raised in this same Kona landscape and she was pointing out to me all the names of the hills and the furrows that we were seeing. Like as far as we could see, each one had a name. I was shocked, I was amazed. And she looked at me puzzled and said, have you ever known a child that doesn't have a name? Um, that's a, a, a really illustrates those kind of relationships. Um, so I encourage you, you know, know your places, know the names, call them by their names. Um, lastly, I just, I know my time is running out. I just wanna leave you with one gift, one um, teaching from Keikuhi. This is um, a, oh wait, can you guys see me or is it just showing a, um, a uh, profile? picture of me. We can see you. Oh, okay, good, good, good. On my side, hard to know what's going on. Um, so this is a melee or a song that comes with a some string art. Uh, these are known around the world. Um, in Hawaii, this is called a hay, which means to snare or to um, trap. So this hay is all about um, harnessing energy in this case, the energy of the night in New York City and in many of your places, it's nighttime. So I thought this was appropriate, calling in um, the subconscious also that comes with that into the dreamscape, into places where we're less um, inhibited and ideas can resurface and unfurl. <laughs> May your path into the subconscious and new ways of knowing the unobstructed. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And finally, Denise Hoffman Brandt. Okay. Well, these were all amazing and quite different, every one of them. And, and this one will be too. Um, I'm going to start with some backstory. I came to landscape architecture by way of studying land art, those open ended constructs forcing reflection on broad issues of society, culture, and environment. And I think of landscape architects as artists, not because they're form makers, but because the discipline demands critical negotiation of social, cultural, and environmental systems. To do this, we have to climb out of our comfort zones to face questions we don't have answers for. And our webs of thought are inextricable from our biological relationships. Design is rhetorical. Digging back into my files, I was surprised by how many of my design proposals promoted public conversation. On the left, an old competition proposal for literally a civic platform to negotiate conflict set among military ruins. And on the right, a 2008 proposal for a temporary garden dominated by a 128 foot long picnic table across and along which crowds could talk. The roots of collaborative conversations like the series Everyday Ecologies are embedded in the optimism of such projects. As an academic, I leveraged transdisciplinary research into long-term speculative planning and design projects, unconstrained by limitations within a professional service industry. I investigated encampment practices in light of soil and climate science, the strategized recovery of refugee rights to landscape, and carbon cycle mechanics, the planned carbon sink infrastructure for New York City, so that we can offset at home and not in distant communities. I stand by these positivist endeavors, and I also see that refugee scenarios remain abhorrent, and even mitigating climate change with the science-grounded policies in the Green New Deal despite its being couched in the comforting language of the systems that created the problem, is at an impasse. In the zombie world, just designing to fix it doesn't. This country is nearly paralyzed, repeating past fixes for present traumas. Paul Krugman defined zombie ideas as, quote, things that people believe in the political sphere that are demonstrably false, 
They've been proved wrong by evidence over and over again, and yet they stay out there shambling along eating people's brains. And he asserts the whole point about zombies actually is you really never can fully kill them. So I figure if Krugman is right and we cannot fully destroy zombie ideas, maybe we can at least redirect ourselves to places where falsehoods living as truths do not lurk. And I think to do this, we must open space between the solid certainties we want to believe in by recognizing our own darker natures and accepting that we cannot always know what is right. The zombie idea I want to kill is that design is positivist, that as long as designers act in accord with established social standards and natural laws, their work will be good. I object to the premise that socially agreed upon structures for knowing can support the weight of absolute truth, especially when the more we look at the world, the more we recognize its indeterminacy. I see that indeterminacy as sublime, a fearsome beauty, like a double negative. It's never reducible to a singular good. Designers and planners of protective features tend to see themselves as active and a positivist project to serve and protect, while camouflaging defensive capacities and shiny objects or things that look like nature. Years ago, I was project manager for that line of anti-blast bollards at Time Warner Center. And it made me wonder, what does it mean when we combine security with amenity? Poland Studios read it for their rhetoric for their anti-blast berms in DC. Is this the best of both worlds? Or should we be asking ourselves why we need hidden features designed to protect us or some of us from also hidden threats? And still bodies do need protection. In 2015, I began to develop a catalog of protective equipment for community managed civil defense, not from floods or nuclear warheads but from violence in the public realm. Protests against killings by use of excessive force and racially discriminatory policing had erupted in cities across the US. Civil disobedience, both peaceful and destructive of property was countered by police using military technologies designed for control of enemy territory and tear gas. Communities caught up in such cycles of aggression inhabit a double negative. There is no way that they can do nothing about the dystopian world they live in and there is nothing they can do to fix it either. Their only space of potential transformation appears to lie in the zone where recognition of grim reality and resistance cohabit. This project was never not intended to offer realistic designs for physical protection. And my aim was to create a rhetorical device that would refocus attention onto the humanity of those needing it. My catalog of designs for dystopia co-opted the tactics of and directly critiqued the whole earth catalog, which advocated for individualist resistance as a refutation of Cold War backyard bomb shelters promoted as civil defense. Stuart Brand's exclamation that we are as gods and might as well get used to it, ignores humans who have been systemically disempowered. And his calls for the individual to conduct his own education, find his own inspiration, shape his own environment, and share his adventure with whoever is interested, do not reach the ears of Americans who are not a him, whose adventures comprise struggles to feed their families, and whose rights as individuals have been usurped by guys like Stuart Brandt himself, beneficiary of institutions promoting values that sustain power predominantly in the hands of mature white males. I began by creating a table of content of products for protection from both violent resistance and violent suppression of it. I never came close to designing all of the tools, but the ideas remain relevant. And not just because resistance to political oppression has escalated, I see another double negative. It is not legitimate for designers to not actively acknowledge the politics of their projects, nor is it reasonable for them to think that they will always do the right thing in the Spike Lee sense of the term. The catalog included research into historic bottom-up resistance. I critique the positivist constructions of the communards. Barricades have been used for centuries, but their inefficacy makes them more symbol of resistance than defensive device. And as the escalation of military aggression around the White House this summer attests, asymmetrical power, a government willing to deploy advanced weaponry against its citizens, threatens still more bloody weeks. I now know a lot about ballistics. The upshot is that when up against military grade weapons, the ballistics shown here outlined in red, protesters and even distant bystanders require serious hardening to survive. 
even Kevlar becomes immaterial for any ballistic outside group A. And while we are after the summer used to seeing the defensive apparatus of militarized policing, it is still shocking that technologies used to protect soldiers from IEDs are now being marketed to schools to protect children. This project could never have been a wholly positive venture, and yet its intention is to transform landscape. It recasts the public realm as not democratic if it is not inclusive of active civil disobedience. Products were designed to be desirable with an eye to material efficiency and were framed as simple cut sheets with protected data and sales bargain that often had a dark satirical edge. As I show them, I will continue reading from the 2015 introduction. Desire to acquire this catalog's merchandise is an important indicator that a community feels threatened by forces prevailing in a dystopian urban landscape wherein reactionary suppression of citizen demands to redress injustices and to recover degraded environment has been and will likely continue to be framed as a necessary evil to maintain order. We present a pragmatic, polemical response. The continuous territory of hardened enclaves is not within the scope of most urban ideals. What your community chooses to deploy will have an immediate impact on surrounding neighborhoods and on the atmosphere and reputation of the city as a whole. Negotiating the need for protection should be an open process that extends across the borders of a single community to encompass diverse factions and constituents. Every order should be accompanied by an investment in undermining the threatening forces that triggered the purchase. Demand for this catalog reveals that sustaining unjust governance, debased economic practices, and a tepid response to climate hazard will undoubtedly bring forth a transformation no less extraordinary and dire than would a radical reform of current policies. We must recognize that to not change is to not not to change. I did not think I would ever design a bulletproof lawn chair, but I could not not design one either because by highlighting the desirability of such an item for someone's front stoop, I contribute to the negation of the necessity for it. Thank you, all of you. Um, so my job is to respond <laughs> and uh, and then also to convey questions. So uh, I'd invite everyone listening to post questions. Um, I'm not gonna, I open by suggesting that a uh, theme or that it might be worth while you're listening to these four speakers speak, uh, that it might be worth thinking about the nature of uh, how they're thinking about time and events and finality and and it's because i was struck by the okay i'm going to come at this from a funny order i keep thinking about the recurring error um that people think that acts of violence are punctuations right that like the situation is too complex so let's invade or, you know, things are getting out of hand, so let's send in the riot cops. And the, there's this sort of belief that, I don't know if it's, if it's the fault of the movies or the movies are a symptom of it, of the way that we tell stories with beginnings, middles, and ends, and then credits. And often violence happens at the climax, and then there's like, you know, maybe a medal ceremony or something, and then, and then the credits. And it, that all four of you um, are talking about a world where that doesn't, that's not true. And it never was, right? That, that there isn't an ending, right? The, the, the building is gone, but right? Like there's no like, but you don't roll credits. I mean, you like there's a story of the building being destroyed and then it's destroyed and then there's the people outside and whatever. And then you roll credits, except that you don't roll credits, right? Because there's still the myth or reality of the lead in the soil and the decisions that people are making from that. And that, that 
that sort of idea, that autocratic idea that there could be a solution, right, or the solution from the designer that Maria opened with, that, that then comes back around um, when Denise is talking about uh, these, these uh, you know, machines for defense and that the kind of the opposite of the brand idea that like all you need is this catalog and to find versus like the catalog itself saying like yeah, like every order here it's it's a sort of like an opposite version of like the Tom's shoes buy one get one right <laughs> like buy buy one give one myth it's like no like buy one and then also invest equally and in never needing to buy another one um and and this is uh you know which then connects back into this this idea of of gardening which shows up in all these different ways in in all of you right from heather's discussion of um the kipukas to the botanical garden to the urban gardens um and so this is not a the most coherent response i've ever given but that that sort of that desperate need that I think we've been engaged in for quite some time in the world of design to like get over the 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 idea of solutions um, is you know bouncing around here in in all of what you're talking about and uh, you know and so then we get to these ideas of a stewardship and gardening and maintenance and repetition and relationship and like moving away from projects and um and i don't know if that's so for those of you who don't know i come at this from a weird angle because i'm not really a landscape person and it's maybe maybe all these things that i'm saying are super obvious to you all because one of the joys of spending time with landscape architects is you're like yeah you know we have plans and ideas about how this thing is going to erode over the next century <laughs> you know it's like we're like yeah this this phone will still be good in a year probably so maybe these things that are that are shocking or, or fascinating to me are are well understood um by your field uh but that's just what i what i was struck by as as all of you were speaking and so I wonder how close are we? So here's now the question for the panel. How close do you think we are to really getting rid of what I think is a sort of a shared zombie idea behind all four of your talks, which is the idea of a solution? Like, are we, are we almost there? Are we past it and I'm just catching up? Like where 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 do you think we're at? <clears throat> Waiting for CNN? No. <laughs> <laughs> where they will not share a solution. <laughs> yes. Um, well, we are together, right? I think. Um, I have lived in the U.S. for 17 years uh, in San you know, traveling, do a lot of travel, but um, this very se series of conversations, <laughs> um, it um, takes courage. Um, so we cannot take it for granted because this is not what Congress and conferences have looked like uh, a lot. No? Those ideas are never really that grouped together and elevated. Um, so I think we are in a moment where we are, it is sort of not adding, but like, okay, okay here, here it is. Here's the density. Here's the density. Here's the, we are. <laughs> Uh, we are articulating those. Um, no, there is nothing new because really originality is not a thing. If you really want to fight autocracy, you cannot be aiming for originality because then you're dead. Then, then, the, the, then the autocrats win. 
Um, but I, I don't know, I think this year is uh, <laughs> activating those magnets, you know, like maybe magnetizing. And speaking of, you know, because I, I, I had felt a lot also that one of the things that perhaps is very um, empowers uh, autocratic systems and, and strange power structures, sometimes if self-censoring, you know, um, and I think we are a little bit more done with that than we were last year. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, you unmuted. Do you have a thought? I, I didn't unmute because I had a thought, but I have thoughts. Um, I'm happy to share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess what most excites me are, are um, uh, a lot of people I encounter who are not interested at all in solutions-oriented actions, right? So, I mean, I will always encounter someone who has a kind of magic bullet fix for some of these situations, right? Like, I heard there is this kind of substance, if you can paint on leaded surfaces, it will just peel off and not be a problem. Or I've heard if you, you know, eat cilantro with lead or a kale with lead, you really won't absorb it. You know, there's different kinds of, all these folk theories that will resolve, you know, our, our exposure to these substances. Um, but I guess I've been most interested in people who just shrug at this and just say, look, this is the, this is the, this is the reality of living in an utterly engineered ecology. And so there's just movement in one direction or another, but there's never a solution or an elimination of that condition, right? And from there, they do all sorts of interesting things, but they don't even assume that this is resolvable in terms of like a, a space of purity, right? And that, that excites me as a kind of practice. These aren't designers, these are just everyday, you know, uh, inhabiting dwelling folks. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, what drives a lot of, certainly drove that project and, and a lot of my thinking is the idea that, you know, it's it's actually destructive to imagine that we're going to fix something. And, you know, your description of, of the gardeners makes perfect sense when I was in New Orleans after Katrina and we were surveying a neighborhood plum orchard and there was this guy who was working on the weekends to rebuild his house and he was growing squash out of the foundation. And I knew that that squash was riddled with, you know, volatile organic compounds, but there was, you know, what if I told them that, you know, I stood there, you know, on the sidewalk looking at the situation and he wanted to chat and I wanted to talk. But the last thing I was going to tell him is your squash is going to kill you. I mean, you know, why? And, and part of me felt like that was an abdication of my responsibility. But the other part of me felt like there's baggage that goes with telling somebody that there's, you know, that they may be doing something unhealthy that is, that is bigger and that I'm not necessarily the arbiter of, that, that I'm not the person who's going to tell him you don't own that ground anymore and you can't grow food in it for yourself. Because that's what that would mean. That would mean telling him that he doesn't own that ground anymore. And, and I think that a, when we talk about design and planning, we often forget the kind of the baggage that goes along with what we're doing. And, and the, you know, the interface of the social baggage and the environmental baggage is, is the area that, that I think we need to be talking the most. And I think to go back to Tim's question, the idea of, of finality and that you know everything we're doing is so important that we have to have an answer is is outdated. It's you know it's it's as if we're we're dealing with classical physics in an era of quantum. It just doesn't make sense anymore. It makes sense in one register, but not across all of our ways of being. I have a thought. Um, the, this thread is making me think about um, invasive species, which is a big deal in Hawaii. We are the invasive species capital of the world. And I can look out my window here and know that none of the plants for probably 
until I could walk a couple hours into the mountains are likely to be native, except a couple little seedlings I have in pots outside. Um, but this whole concept of what is native, what is non-native, what is invasive, um, this is not necessarily a an indigenous concept. Um, there's a lot of um, mismatch between ecological uh, categorization of the natural world. And I think this also relates to, you know, dealing with what is and also having different ways of um, understanding the utility and significance of things kind of an evolving knowledge system. And so um, that's, we'll never get rid of all the invasive species here. There is no solution, but people can't stop talking about it. On the other hand, um, indigenous cultural practitioners don't recognize um, the coconut palm as a tourist icon or as a um, landscape feature or a landscaping feature um, or as something hazardous that needs to be mitigated um, so that people don't get hurt by coconuts falling on their heads, but it's a sacred tree um, that's essential for life. So um, that's, that's kind of the way that I'm thinking about this discussion. We've, we've been talking a bit at the Center for Complexity about the this, this solution thing and our sort of frustrations with it. And one of the things I've also started to wonder, which is maybe in the other direction, is that we might have, we might be over waiting what solution means. <laughs> no, like, because it, there is a way in which there's like, 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 oh, if it's like, I'm, I'm thirsty, and then I drank a glass of water, and that solved my problem. And I don't, I don't think that I'm never going to be thirsty again. Right, that I'm like, then I don't need to get into like, and so, but whereas when we're, and I, when we're like talking about design solutions, we do seem to think that, that those are meant to be more, more final, and maybe they never were. You know, like maybe even, mm -hmm. you know, like, like maybe we've, we're, we've constructed a, a straw man that, of, that was never actually there in the first place. I don't, I don't know. We spent a lot of time being. Well, one of the questions in the chat, somebody commented, Anna's role of the lot, so that it's. Is, is not assuming that these issues are resolvable for the average layperson in active intellectual progress, or is it complacency and depression? And, and I think that that's a good question because it's not just the, the role of the, the designers. I mean, if we put ourselves in, in, in the role of a service industry, we're being told what to expect, or, or we're being told to perform to expectations of, of a public. And I think that, you know, where, where in this dance of, of making things and designing things and planning, are we saying we can do things to hype our capacities and where is the public expecting their problems to be solved when they may not be solvable? But there's this, there, it's, it's, a, it's a big gray area of you know, who owns this scenario because I may say, okay, you had your glass of water, now go away, but person I gave it to may say, wait a minute, I'm still thirsty. You know, I think that there's, it's, I think that it, it has to do with bigger ideas of, of why we do what we do. A few more individual questions here for some of the panelists that maybe we can, we can go through. So I'll start uh, one from Ava Tomasula y Garcia for uh, Cassie. Um, especially during the pandemic, there's a lot of Chicago neighborhood mutual aid groups that are thinking more about subsistence farming and neighborhood control of food sources. One thing happening is that folks are trying to develop small subsistence plots into already existing tenant organizing, demanding landlords allow tenants to use land for food production alongside anti-eviction pandemic demands. 
really want to hear more about the imagination of an always coming big happy development gentrification process that some folks who buy toxic flats are banking on, as opposed to what you began to mention that there are people who start buying and farming the plots with some other kind of future in mind. Is this other imagined future outside of development? This or and the same as urban foods or vanity autonomous food zones, that kind of thing? Or um, yeah. Great. Um, thanks so much for that question. Um, I don't think it's else. I, I guess what strikes me is like the willingness to have a radically present, like a, a, a presentist imagination here, right? To not sort of you engage if you engage in kind of um, elaborate, you know, um, gardening, landscaping, soil prep, all this kind of stuff. It's it's you know the idea here is that it could be temporary, it could be long term, but you know, the, the pushback on people doing these elaborate projects is always something is coming here and you will have to leave and this will all be gone. This is a temporary, you know, um, construction here. And that would be the general frame, but I think what's most exciting is people who refuse that altogether and just say like, look, you know, people have been saying that something's been coming here for 30 plus years, right? And yet we have cycle, like cycles of, of these busts that we see again and again, you have like several, this is an area that has been, you know, defined by at least four or five concerted rounds of demolition in the past century alone, right? So it's it's been existing more as a demolished space than it has as a kind of coherent space. So in this kind of context, people are not not necessarily expecting that, right? And so they simply refuse. And, and I find this really exciting. So what you'll see are people who are just um, not even asking for permission to do gardening, but simply you know, setting up these small gardens on, on plots that they don't even necessarily prep or truck and soil for. And if someone points out the unwiseness of this, either it's consuming and you'll have to move. I'm sorry, I have a small child who is <laughs> coming up. Um, um, they just say, show me when, show me when we, uh, when that's coming, right? It hasn't come in 30 plus years. And so why should this be a structuring um, uh, imagination for us right now? And I find that exciting. It doesn't mean that, that this is necessarily healthy or wise, but the refusal of that kind of imagination of growth, I think is exciting and unusual. Um, from Jane McRae for Heather. Uh, I love the idea of a Kumuhula leading groups of natural resource professionals. How did you find your relationship with the earth change as your embodied knowledge increased? How was this change reflected in your job or for others in your group? Thanks for um, reading out the question. You saved me a little more typing. I had just started to type in an answer. Easier to talk. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think one thing I just want to put out there for people that don't know is that um, some kinds of hula, the kind of hula that Kekuhi and her family do, and many others, though not all, um, it's completely rooted in a kind of spiritual ecology and uh, worship of the natural environment and really completely all about kinship relationships with nature and so it makes a lot of sense and they trace their genealogy to Pele, the volcanic deity, for example. Um, but it made a lot of sense for her to be the person in this role to, you know, if you want for to oversimplify it, like train the trainer or influence the people that make bigger impacts on the land by working with resource manager types. Um, as a way to kind of multiply the impact that that work can have instead of working only with hula practitioners or community members. So um, I think it my, personally, my um, relationship with this place, it has helped me feel, and I wasn't born here. Um, I was, I've been here 23 years, but it's helped me feel more connected to this place and more, um, have a more intimate relationship with this place. And I think that's a common thing that other people who are participating in the Halau um, would find. And so, especially for those of us that are in um, agencies and large institutions to kind of infiltrate and perpetuate to get, you know, like I said, making space and holding space for these things to become more institutionalized, these ways of seeing um, and conversations 
after you know years, we see this is happening. Um, so that's. You know, I'm not sure if that gets at your question, but yeah. And this is for the entire panel from Babby Dunnington. I see a lot of future solutions possible with landscape designers supporting the safety and health of all people through ideas like these presented tonight. Food, food serenity through community gardens, capping toxins and composting, protection from militarization are bigots that we can't seem to get rid of. Centering design on what communities really need for survival in this reality, which isn't positive. Do you think that this can shape the way we see public space? Can it change the way we approach public park design, for example? Maria, you started talking about parks. You start. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, um, everybody, really, so such a joy. Um, it's complicated because um, I guess three things uh, that come to mind. Um, those typologies of public spaces. Uh, we know them, right? They had, they had been with us for a long time. And it's a matter of a scale and connecting them um, and how they connect. Uh, what I'm very interested on right now on, you know, you guys been talking about like, the idea of master planning is what Catherine is saying that uh, people don't believe it, right? So, and that's, you know, I've been, this is my third semester teaching in Chicago. And I will say that is the, is the dying of master planning. Right? And I feel that it's so tropical in a way because, yes, people don't ask for permissions. They do whatever they want in the anti loves. They don't believe what the government says. I'm like, I'm home. <laughs> that, that I understand. So when you ask me about the future of these public spaces typologies, I say it's um, not that different. It, what I believe that what's different. It's not necessarily the what, but the how, the how you do it. Um, or I guess that's the part I'm most curious about. Um, because I think the what is a conversation that it, we cannot bounder or we will be falling in the same trap of representing a particular school of aesthetics or a particular a power line or a particular a point of view of a moment in time, but the how that we can change, right? We know we have to pay people fairly. We know that we cannot ask people to work 90 hours a week. We know that we cannot walk into a community and impose their ideas. We know that projects have no expiration dates and that the very notion of a project has to be dismantled. And it's about long lasting engagements and passing the baton through generations and generations. So I'm really curious about the how. Um, and that, 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 I think that's what's next. That's, that's what was gonna change. That, that, that's where I'm very curious to operate. Um, the modus operandi, the, modus, the, the how, because maybe because I'm from the tropics or I could be from Inglewood or from North London. I'm just tired of waiting. I can't, I cannot, I, I do not accept waiting. Um, and, and I think when you are free of that idea that you have to wait, um, so, no, power likes you to wait, um, then you know that you're going to make mistakes, uh, but you are exploring things and, and that's a life, that's life. Uh, you know that you will have a community that will hold you up and support you up uh, when, when you need it the most. You know that, and, and that is moving. That is not waiting, right? There is no saudade on that. There is no nostalgia on that. There is um, enthusiasm as the bottom line. Um, if I sound cheesy, please excuse me, but it's rather muscle. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, um, you know, can, can, can you find dictatorships with cheesiness? I bet, <laughs> yeah, 
I, I tell you guys, it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, when is when is grounded on like a, 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 a lot of a passionate, detailed, precise work, you know? Uh, the conversations I, I, I try to move away from every day is when people ask me and then I present projects or so, and I, yeah, projects, give me solutions. And then, oh, but that's not ecological, that's cultural. That's just cultural. I'm like, okay, <laughs> fun. <laughs> Um, those those boxes where we so if we allow the conversation to focus on the what, then we uh, then we limit our opportunities to to stop the waiting, to stop the waiting and empower empower new ways of how. Uh, yeah, I see that. I, I totally see that, but I, I have a different angle. And you summed it up when you said that uh, what is it, the typologies of public space, we all know what they are. And I think that's the problem. We don't question them. And, you know, I look at Cassie's uh, communities who have a very slippery sense of, of the space around them and how they occupy it and, you know, where they're going to put that garden in the area where the house was, but not where the porch was. And, and vacant lots have different identities depending on if somebody's holding it for investment or they're gonna farm on it. And I, I think that it's by putting the typologies out there as a kind of commodity, you know, we're gonna give you a park or we're gonna give you a garden or we're gonna give you this thing. We're actually fueling the, the, the language, the, the, we're, we're, we're sort of creating the conditions of our own demise that you know, we need to be actually busting up those typologies and saying, no, it's this and this, and, or it's all of these things so that we can start to, to open space. I mean, I think that to me, it, it's just that, that all of these sort of devices we use to organize what we're doing as, as a kind of artifact are the very things we need to be, be breaking up to make room for, for these new endeavors. Could not agree more. Um, I just, when people ask, what's the typology you're going to give me? I tell them, I don't know. <laughs> Let's work together and figure it out. You know, I just, I just trust the how to, yeah, I guess. Oh, in the back for, um, Heather, I put our um, <laughs> Cosmograma. When we started uh, in some of our travels to the tropical dry forests you know, of the lake and the Caribbean Sea, we talked to the indigenous communities in all these places. And one super interesting thing uh, for us as, an out as outsiders learning in these trips, you know, um, they don't use north, south, east, west. No, the orientation system is not the colonizer's orientation system, right? It's towards the mountain. So I, when you were talking, I was like, oh yes, the cosmograma from the uh, from the Caribbean Sea, and it's like toward the hacia la mar salada, towards the salty water, towards the no, um, towards uh, and and there are no uh, landscape features. You know, they are. They are living beings, they are, <laughs> they are lives, they are alive. Um, so what a beauty that your orientation system is living, moving things. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, I, the drawing of my dreams, so it's probably gonna take me 10 years, <laughs> Is the cosmogramas of the tropical dry forests of the Caribbean Sea for just to say something, you know, they, mm. um, to understand all these moving orientations uh, that are about life. Um, mm. that about like, can you be like, and then you, and then it hits you. And it's like your very <laughs> orientation system is a colonial one. Wake up, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but mm -hmm. time, I think to me, traveling is one of, it does that to me, like it's really, um, 
it really opens up your imagination and the possibilities of things that you never considered before you just took for granted yeah absolutely you have to come check out our dry land for us i would love to <laughs> so we're coming to the end of our time together for this evening i want to invite the panelists, if they have any last brief thoughts they want to convey. Um, any final words? Words of gratitude to every single one of you that were so hard organizing these conversations. I can't wait for next week. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, I'm at your service. Uh, any continue these conversations for you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I also extend my thanks for um, being able to participate in the conversation and super interesting to learn from all of you. So thank you. And I'm happy to hear from anyone as well who wants to talk more about dirt and gardening. <laughs> and <health. laughs> and toxic. Well, I, I just want to thank everybody for joining us to, on this very stressful night. And, uh, you know, we can all go back to CNN or, what, or whatever our news feed of choice is as soon as this is over. Um, and thank you for uh, all of these amazing talks. I have to say it was hard to go last because everything was so fascinating. And thank you all. And please join us next week for the final uh, conversation in the series. Um, we're uh, looking forward to uh, Julia Zerniak, uh, Anna Maria Duran, uh, Matthew Seibert, and uh, oh my God, I'm so tired. I taught today too. Um, at any rate, uh, and I'll be moderating. Uh, so please uh, start preparing questions now, or I'll just ask questions nobody cares about. Um, but thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you for the last event. And thank you, Tim Malley, for juggling this crazy array of <laughs> presentations. <laughs> it was a little like that, that show Chopped, where you had to make a meal of all the weird ingredients. <laughs> this is wonderful. I really appreciate the, the range and the chance to see these connections bounce across these very, on the surface, different things. and find those deep, deep resonances. It's really, really a pleasure. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Yeah, we look forward to juggling this into some kind of publication. <laughs> All right. So good night. And uh, thanks again for joining.